So why do we need to teach poker in business schools? Well, the basic idea is that every management decision is about risk. It's about uncertainty. We make these decisions and we don't know what's going to happen in the world around us. And we still need to make the decisions. We can't avoid the decisions themselves. So poker is very similar to this. The poker players have to make decisions in every round of the game. And these decisions are on the background of uncertainty. And that's why poker is a great analogy if we're looking to teach our students about how to manage the risk in innovation, which is my course, for example, but in everything else. I'll give you an example not from a management area. Let's talk about medical decisions. So you have a cancer patient and you're an oncologist and you have to decide on the course of treatment for that patient. If you're too aggressive, you can kill the patient with the treatment. If you're not aggressive enough, the cancer is going to take care of the patient for you. So when you make medical decisions like that, it's not about taking as much risk as possible, but it's also not about avoiding the risk. It's about managing the risk in the correct way. And in management contexts, it's very similar to that. So let's take banking. Okay, so in banking, if you meet a bank manager and they tell you, I gave thousands of loans in my lifetime and everybody always paid me back. You know, I never defaulted on a loan. That's not really a good bank manager because banks make their money by taking risks, calculated risks. And by taking those risks, they can get paid more. They get paid interests. That is much higher than if they make loans that have very, very little in way of risk. So what if you meet a banker and they tell you, I gave thousands of loans in my lifetime and everybody always defaulted? It's obvious that that bank manager is not a bank, it's not a good bank manager either. So what makes for a good bank manager? Somebody who optimizes the revenue and the profits for their bank. It's somebody who looks at risk in a calculated way and that makes you know, a, a, an attempt to manage the risk for their bank. Maybe by spreading the loans across different industries, maybe by giving loans to different types of people in the population so that they don't concentrate all the risk in one way. So after we saw that risk is generally a part of management, let's talk about specifically risk in the context of innovation, which is my area. So when we look at innovation risk, what happens to companies if they don't innovate? What happened to Blockbuster? You know, we, we, Blockbuster was one of the huge companies in the world. What happened to Kodak? Both of these companies are examples of what happens to you if you don't take enough risk in the innovation context. But at the same time, innovation itself can kill you. New products cost a lot of money to put into the market. Not only that, every new product that you innovate on is as alternative risk, there are a lot of other products you could have invested in and you didn't because you put all your chips, all your money on that one innovation. And if it fails, it can have very dire consequences for your business as well. So in innovation, what do we have to do? We can't avoid the risk. We can't run away from it, but we also can't embrace it. We can't put as many new products into the market as we can simply because the cost of the failure is going to kill us. And at the same time, we know that we have to do something. We have to change the way we react to the different market conditions and to our competitors. So if you can't avoid risk and you can't embrace risk, you have to find a way to manage risk. And over the last 25 years, that's been my area of both research and consulting. I help companies manage the risk of innovation. And I work with some of the biggest companies, the biggest names you will know in the world regarding exactly that, how to create a structure within the organization, within the management team that takes enough risk on one hand, but doesn't accelerate the risk throughout the innovation process. So what does all of that have to do with poker again? Well, even if you don't know how to play poker, you must have seen poker on television. There's a bunch of people sitting around a table and they each have a bunch of money in front of them. They have chips that basically stand for money. And the cards are dealt around the table. And when they get their cards, they have to make a decision. Are we in or are we out? 
What happens to players who hesitate, who are worried about risk, who don't play enough? Well, guess what? There are fixed costs to sit around that table, just like companies have fixed costs in innovation. They have R&D departments, they have engineers, scientists working for them. In the poker world, you have something called antis, okay, something called blinds, that make you have to put some money into the game, even if you don't play at all. So the players who don't play, who don't take enough risk, even if they have good cards, they get eliminated very, very quickly from the game. But the same is true for people who play everything. If you play every card you get, let's say you get a 2-7 unsuited, and even if you don't know what that means, let me guarantee that this is a bad hand of poker to start with. If you play every hand you get and you count on your ability to bluff, for example, you're going to lose too. So poker players lose if they don't take enough risk, but they also lose if they take too much risk. And therefore, if we look at the strategies of the professional poker players, the ones at the top of their game, we can see that what they do is manage the risk. They take calculated risk and they minimize that risk whenever they can, but they don't avoid it altogether. And if you look at the World Series of Poker, for example, this is a tournament where 10,000 different players start the tournament uh, in one day in Vegas and only nine people end up in the final table. The percent of professional poker players in that final table is always amazing. It's always much higher than you would expect because most of the 10,000 players that play the game are not professionals, they're amateurs. And that just shows you how much strategy is part of poker. Most of you probably consider poker to be a luck game. Luck has nothing to do with poker. Luck is just what is going on around us in the world in every decision we make. It's the uncertainty that I talked about. It is the strategy of professional poker players that consistently gets them to the final table and consistently makes them able to win against amateurs, against people like me, for example, who love poker but are not professional about playing it. We don't know how to manage the risk quite the same. And let me end with an example of a poker game, because when we talk about poker, it's not just one game. There are 72 different games that I personally cataloged in the poker world, and one of them is called Indian poker, and it might help you get a better salary next time you negotiate with your boss. So how is Indian poker played? You take the deck of cards, you pick one random card, and your opponent, there's only two people in this game, your opponent picks another card, and then you stick it up here. And notice that I didn't look at my card. I don't know what it is. But I do see my opponent. I do see the player playing against me. And I see their card. And now I have to bet that my card up here, and I don't know what that is, is better than their card. And there's a round of betting that goes on. And if I can scare them out and make them fold their cards, I can win even without them playing. Now, what does that have to do with management? Well, I want you to imagine that you're in a negotiation with your boss about your salary. You know exactly how much you need this job. You know exactly how many alternatives you have. In other words, you know exactly how strong the card of your opponent is. You know how strong your boss is in the negotiation. What you don't know is how strong your card is. You don't know how good your card up here or how high it is. And that's because you don't know how much your boss needs you. You don't know if they have any alternatives. You don't know if they've been waiting for this moment for you to ask for more money so they can fire you. Your boss is in exactly the same situation, though. They know exactly how much they need you. But they don't know how much you need that job. You don't know if you're serious about willing to get up, get out of the office, and go find an alternative. And you still have to negotiate, right? You negotiate your salary. So you want to get a better salary next time, go and read a book or go online and search Indian poker and find a good way to strategize your negotiation with your boss. You do that and you're going to succeed. And if this was interesting to you, I suggest you come visit us at Ono because we'll keep the light on for you and this is just the beginning of what you're going to find here. Thank you very much for listening and it's been a pleasure.